However, also remember this is a multilingual country. It's not just bilingual. And I happen to speak a fair bit of Chinese and a bit of Kiwi, good day, Mike. And you've got to understand all these people want to hear the broadcasting in their own language. And why shouldn't we? Other stations do. Thank you. Now, I, I, I'm just a Toronto boy, but it's my impression that French language radio is available throughout Canada. Yes. So uh, uh, I have, there's one more question regarding, uh, re regarding broadcasting, and then we're moving to another topic. Uh, and, and then we'll have time for one question on the other topic, and then we're going to come to the concluding uh, remarks of, the, uh, of these candidates. So this question is, if you are elected to represent the people of uh, Victoria, what will you do to protect and promote uh, a national, national public broadcasting? And I believe that uh, Paul Somerville starts. I'll fire Don Cherry. Uh, the key to anything uh, that's sustainable, um, as Liza Minnelli and Joel Gray sang in Cabaret, is money. Uh, it's one of the big issues that our city faces, Canadian municipalities face, because uh, they're the poor poor cousins uh, of the provincial and federal governments. Uh, so uh, an intelligent strategy uh, with clear targets uh, that will allow the CBC and other public broadcasters to know what their funding base is going to be. And it could include the tax deduction that I've uh, discussed on people's tax returns. It could be um, a movement to uh, the kind of uh, funding drives that the PBS does. Uh, but it must begin with restoring the 10% cut uh, that the Conservatives did uh, in the last budget. Thank you. Uh, Don, you're next. The first thing that I would do is the obvious thing. I would uh, become the friend of the Heritage Minister. <laughs> I would actually try and build some connection with Mr. Moore, who has the authority to do this. And I, I think that, I mean, it's a simple thing to say, but if you have authority, you don't want to be attacked by somebody who's biting at your heels all the, all the time. And that's the partisan environment within Parliament at the moment. But you do want to form alliances with people who share the same values. And I think that Mr. Moore has certain ideas that are, uh, are discussable. And I think to initiate the discussion with like-minded people in Parliament is the way to go. To actually express that this number of people came to this meeting, I think it's important for him to know that. It's important for him to know the depth of the, of the feeling towards this institution, that it's seen as being important. He can't be allowed to forget that. And how the conversation and should go, I think is, uh, that's, well, we'll see how it, how it happens. But it's a conversation. <laughs> We've heard from this podium often tonight, share the same values. Why can't we talk with people who don't share the same values? And my party does not share the value of increasing the debt by having more funding and more funding and more funding. You haven't heard anybody trying to reduce the debt. And has anybody said there's a way to save money in all of this? I have been chairman of a department that has had to cut money and we said, no, we don't lose our best faculty. We can't do this. Do you know, it's amazing what you can do without when you have an opportunity to really squeeze and think differently. And CBC has got to think differently if it's going to survive. Because in my attempts to save money and reduce the debt is doing more for the CBC than all these other things. Do you realize that? Because CBC is very vulnerable and will be cut entirely trying to keep the country from going in debt. Think about that and vote for me. What the question was, uh, if elected, what would you do to protect and promote broadcast, the national broadcasting? I would have three answers. First, I would very much like to get on the House of Commons Heritage Committee. And I would like to be on that committee to ask that once again, we see if we can get a commitment that that 
uh, a year ago that committee recommended that the CBC and Radio Canada's core funding be increased to an amount equal to at least half of what most Western democracies invest in their public broadcasting. If that were done, that would, incre that would provide $230 million of additional funding. I would like to fight specifically for that. The la last thing I would do is I would work with that committee to see if we can actually achieve a non-partisan, non-patronage approach to appointments on the CBC, both at the board level, the president level, because I think we need to do a lot better. They should be accountable to all parties the way that other officers of the legislature are. We can do that without having to entrench this terrible patronage that just seems to continue no matter which party is in power. And now for something uh, substantially different. Uh, and by the way, I put on my glasses not because this question is illegible, just because this person writes very small. Uh, there are two questions, but I'm going to mix them together because that's all the time we have. But there's a common theme. So how can we guarantee Beacon Hill Park will not be impacted by the sewage pipeline uh, four foot diameter through the park? Question mark. So that's the first part of it all. And then this one says, for Murray Rankin, <laughs> Federal funding for a poorly conceived sewage treatment plant is not a gift. It is a large, unnecessary tax increase. Why do you continue to push for this project in light of the scientific and medical opinions that you should be relying upon to oppose this project outright? Now, uh, that puts some pressure on you, uh, Marie, because uh, you only have 60 seconds to. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, he, he hasn't answered it yet in this election. But the, very, <laughs> but the good news is that two people speak before you, okay? So, uh, uh, Don Galloway. Well, I agree with the science. Uh, but here's the, here's the thing I want to raise with you. There is focus upon uh, the sewage treatment plant in this federal campaign. We're all facing it, and we're all asking the question, or we're all being addressed the question about what are we going to do about sewage. And I think that the question is actually a metaphor, that people aren't really interested in our three opinions about this issue, but that people actually want to know what sort of leader they're actually going to uh, be voting for. Is this a leader who actually takes local concerns, monetary concerns, infrastructure concerns seriously? Is this somebody who identifies that this is a complicated problem that has a scientific base, that has a political base, an economic base, and a, and a legal base, and can the person that we are voting for handle each of these dimensions? And I think that that's what you are asking, and the answer I want to give for me is, yes, I can. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. I'm glad you are sufficiently tolerant to let me speak. And I hope that you will listen to the dissidents in this world. The sewer project is baffling. I mean, it's nonsensical. I'm a seaman, I go to sea all the time, I'm a scuba diver, I swim in this stuff, I'm a doctor. But the best and most effective treatment is actually a septic tank. And we country folk know that it works. And then you put very clean effluent in the ocean and the solids can be used for fertilizer. You ask anybody in the country. Ladies and gentlemen, the problem is our economic base and it will continue to go down because we do not have enough Canadians. We do not have enough children. Welcome children, all of them. Every little one that arrives, welcome those children. They are here to build the country. And as a chairman of a department, one of the things we did in the university, and this was long ago, was start education as an exportable commodity.
I just want to start by saying in my 58 seconds that I agree with uh, Mr. Galloway entirely that this is a complicated uh, com a scientific, environmental, and economic issue. It's an issue in this campaign that I, I obviously agree is important. My objective would be, if elected, to try to work with the CRD to produce the least costly, most environmentally effective solution for this particular issue. I can't speak to the way in which the CRD has uh, addressed this issue. This was a legal requirement, of course, by the federal and provincial governments going back some time. I can't speak to, example, the way in which the Beacon Hill uh, area would be affected, nor whether it's necessary, it seems to me not, to go to Heartland Road and so forth with all of the expense and piping and, and disruption that that would entail. As a federal representative, I believe that my role would be to try to find the uh, funding, keep the funding that was made available for this, and work to make it the most environmentally acceptable and least expensive uh, uh, project as possible. Thank you. When well, we started our campaign uh, five weeks ago uh, and made a point uh, that the MAD plan, the billion dollar boondoggle, of the Triple P pipeline, the pressurized poop pipeline from Macaulay Point to Hartle Landfill, was bad economics, bad science, and bad Victoria. I was told by Stephen Andrew on CFAX that I was nuts and it wouldn't matter. Well, it does matter because it's not about sewage. It's about democracy. It's about science-based public policy. And it's about the huge tax increases that are going to price businesses and families out of the city of Victoria. It's bad science because the environmental uh, responsible solution we're using now is the, using the best available technology. It's bad economics because it threatens to bankrupt our city as the costs spiral out of control. And it's bad for Victoria because we should be investing in storm sewers and streets and services. Help me stop the billion dollar boondoggle. Thank you. We now uh, uh, reach the time of the of the concluding statements, and by a prior agreement, we'll go uh, in reverse order to the uh, original statements. The final statements are two minutes each. But just as the uh, these candidates are preparing for that, I just say that um, the last question reminded me of a, an anecdote from Sir John Macdonald, just vaguely. Uh, and he once had to stand on a manure spreader to speak to people, and, and he said, this is the first time that I have stood on my opponent's platform. <laughs> so, I don't know if you, ladies and gentlemen, have noticed, but the chairman has never addressed me by name the whole evening. I have a name, I have a person, and I have a view that doesn't coincide with everybody else's, but it is scientifically and practically grounded. Canadians are pragmatic. In the end, they will, pragmatic will reign. And right now, as I say, we need more tax makers rather than tax spenders. And ladies and gentlemen, the Christian Heritage Party is the only party that dares to be different. And you've got to listen to that, whether you like it or not. You've got to listen to that, and I hope it guides your voting. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. What, what that means is that there's a, a very visible computer-based two-minute clock, and uh, it's is. now ready to go. Ichi, ni, san. I'm here tonight because liberals are proud of the strong, caring, and prosperous country liberalism made of Canada that includes unwavering support of public broadcasting. I'm also here to send a message to the most arrogant, mean-spirited, narrow, fiscally irresponsible and scientifically stupid government in the long history of Canada. <laughs> Stephen Harper is a practitioner of the poison politics of anger and divide. Veteran pollster Alan Gregg has called Stephen Harper's style of governing an assault on reason, Orwellian, a world framed by superstition, 
dogma and orthodoxy instead of facts and reason. This has led to an ugly and uncivilized politics. This is not my Canada. The Harper legacy in six years includes gutting carefully constructed environmental protections, reducing support to public broadcasting to starvation levels, and turning our prisons into crime schools with mandatory sentencing. This is not my Canada. What century do we live in when a female minister of the crown, responsible to protect all women, votes for a bill that could slam the door shut on a woman's right to choose? This could never be my Canada. Liberal politics are different. They are the politics of inclusion and empathy, facts and evidence, not dogma and ideology. Yet, dogma and ideology is forcing on Victoria a sewage plant that we don't need that will have a severe financial impact on seniors and students because of huge tax increases. It's bad science, it's bad economics, and it's bad for Victoria. Finally, what is my vision for Canada? It is that any child born into a family of limited circumstances can dream, a live, dream and live a life of unlimited opportunity. That shared chance of being Canadian should be told by a Canadian public broadcaster. Thank you. Well, thank you for your patience, and I want to thank initially, first of all, my fellow uh, panelists or uh, uh, contenders thank you. for uh, this, this really interesting debate on a very, very important subject. I also want to thank you, A, for attending, and B, for your excellent questions tonight. Um, I want to thank Friends of Canadian Broadcasting and Mr. Morrison for convening this and making this discussion about such an important topic possible. I don't know, um, I just hope that you'll remember when you go to the polls, the $115 million that was taken out of the budget of the CBC shortly after a promise was made by Minister Moore to quote, maintain or increase the funding for CBC. That was one promise, obviously, that was not kept. It's one promise Mr. Harper has kept. He said that when I, quote, when I get through with, with uh, you won't recognize Canada. Well, I think that's a promise he's keeping every day. His Canada is not my Canada. His values are not my Canada. And I don't think they're yours either. I just want to say one thing in conclusion. Some of you remember when we were trying to get CBC back in uh, the late 90s, we used to have bumper stickers. I had one in my car, and it said this. Quote, I'm voting CBC. I just hope that same sentiment you'll take with you to the polling station next Monday. Thank you. I came to Canada in 1975. I was a young professor living in Kingston. I lived in a one bedroom apartment. I worked very hard just to keep up with the students. I I uh, came home at night, I turned on the radio. I'm not a big television fan, I'm sorry to say, but I turned on the radio. And within my first year, I learned how to be a Canadian. I gained my identity as a Canadian through the CBC radio. It was, I learned about who our icons were. I, heard, I learned about who our artistic leaders were. I learned about the debates that define us. I learned from intelligent, sensitive individuals. I learned how to become a citizen through the CBC radio. That is something that I think we all treasure, because I think we have all learned to be citizens through the, through the CBC radio. I then became a scholar of citizenship law. There's very few of us around. Uh, knowing how to think about citizenship law, knowing the history of citizenship law uh, is something that is very important to me. I have discovered in studying citizenship law that there are many views of citizenship that governments can take to the subject. Some of them are remarkably hokey. I think in the, uh, in the 1990s, when the citizenship uh, laws were being changed, there was an idea of having a sort of hallmark poem as the preamble to the Citizenship Act. It was dreadful, it was, uh, but it was dismissed quickly. Some of the views of citizenship are, that we have to live with from government are depressing, such as the ones that we're living through now. 
on Canada Day when Mr. Harper says that Canada is a warrior nation. Yeah. I just cringe because that is not my view of who we are or of our history. We have to relive our history through our own experiences. According to my watch, and it's not a stopwatch, it's 8.30. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I just want to do two or three little things before, before you leave. It'll be less than a minute. Uh, number one, we noticed uh, an Elections Canada release today posted on its website. It said the preliminary number of voters at the advanced polls in the three uh, by-elections. Calgary Centre, 2,740. Durham, 5,171. Wow. Victoria, 6,440. Oh, yeah. Kind of dwarfs the 3,250 families who support the Friends of Canadian Broadcasting, <laughs> unless you accept that there might be two voters at each other. <laughs> so, uh, I wanted to thank the uh, Victoria-based volunteers, all of them supporters of our cause, who worked so hard to put this together and other things that have happened during this by-election. I wanted to thank my, my colleague Jim Thompson, who has taken the primary responsibility for, for organizing uh, this. And I, I wanted to thank all of you for coming. And last but not least, uh, to these candidates for, uh, for presenting themselves for, uh, for your evaluation yeah. tonight. Huh. Thank you very much. Very That's your job.